Sorry about that. Oh, apparently I was muted. Um, yes, uh, so there's been various of these, these cloud operating systems. Mostly they're like, um, uh, you know, for example, the OCaml people have this thing called Mirage, which is absolutely great because it means you can run a completely OCaml system as um, a VM all by itself. And it's absolutely marvelous if you like OCaml, and if you don't want to write your whole program in OCaml, then it's not really for you. Um, the, some people involved with NetBSD have done something much more interesting. Um, what they've done is they've sawn, they call it rump kernels, they've, they've sawn the VM system off of NetBSD, and uh, the system called Layer, and they've turned NetBSD the kernel into a library, which you can link against the NetBSD libc, and now you can sort of compile your program and link it all into a single address space image um, and run it on various things. They've got a, a Zen thing that you can run your programs on. They've got, um, they've got one that, that they call POSIX, which lets you run it as a process, sort of a bit like UML, only it really is a single process. It's, it's got no um, no scheduler, nothing like that. Um, so this is this is this is quite good because this means you can take allegedly normal programs and compile them for this environment. But their build system is a bit bad, um, and even if their build system wasn't a bit bad, it poses certain problems. So now we get on to our nice Debian world. So here's a, a nice diagram of some packages. You know, you, you have some source packages. I've not shown all the build dependencies um, because there's going to be no room on this slide. Uh, so we, we've got some packages. You tend to have some kind of, maybe you get it from Git, maybe you uh, have an upstream tarball, you add some Debian files to it, and you build it and it produces a .deb. So uh, that's all very nice. Uh, and this is what I now need to do. So you will notice that I have got Zen in this three times. So the Zen upstream source code has to be used three times in this build process. Um, we need to build it once in the normal way to generate um, the actual hypervisor and all the things that people are expecting. And um, that build, at the moment it doesn't, yes? No. Light on it now. Yes? Okay, thank you. Uh, did you already tell us what's the problem you're trying to solve? Uh, yes. And why, I missed that. Um, what I'm trying to produce is I'm trying to build these NetBSD rump kernel programs in Zen because we want to make. And we, we and, want and, to and, use and the Zen, the, the rump kernel thing that the NetBSD people have done to run parts of the Debian tool stack and its support software in yes. VMs. Yes, and you want to do it the Debian way? Well, ideally before I bake too much of my build system in stone, I, I'd like some advice on what yeah. it would okay. be nice for this all to look like. Okay. Um, so what I've got here is boxes, and the, the, round, box, the round boxes are, are packages that sort of um, mostly already exist, and the square boxes are things that don't have a place to live at the moment. Uh, you know, I have a working directory on my computer that contains stuff, um, but exactly how this should be put into something like a Debian archive is um, less clear. Uh, so, yes, so the, the ultimate goal is, for example, we've got a thing called PyGrub. Let's take PyGrub because that's a nice, easy one. Uh, nice, easy one, uh, the top right corner. Um, so, at the moment, if you, most people using Zen um, use a thing called PyGrub, which is a sort of half assed emulation of Grub, Grub1, Grub2, Lilo, SysLinux. 
um, anything else that anybody decided to put parsing code in it for. Um, it's written in Python. It links to libfs, libfs image, which you may or may not have heard of, which is a collection of file system drivers in user space. And this runs in your master control domain, that is your, your, you know, your host VM, um, looks into the guest's file system, finds the kernel according to, you know, it may even put up, it, it can even display um, menus, um, and then passes that, that, it finds the kernel and passes it to the rest of the system for actually booting the guest. And this is not ideal because if your file system driver has some kind of bug, then that's a security vulnerability. Uh, there are also other reasons why it's, it's kind of not ideal. The, the console handling of this weird extra process that's not running in a guest um, is a bit messed up, um, or at least complicated. Um, now, PVGrub, PVGrub2, is going to solve all these problems sometime in the next decade. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to do um, a, a, a stopgap solution, which is, well, we'll build Python for NetBSD rump kernels, and then we can run PyGrub as a VM. And we'll grant that VM access to the guest's file system, but it doesn't need any other privilege. It provides the kernel to the tool stack, and, um, and yeah. So, you see I've got this rump, zen, libs, and tools here. This is a combination of an enormous pile of NetBSD source code, some of which is rump kernel specific, but most of which isn't. It's basically just NetBSD. So you see I've got 64 megabytes of, of .git directory. I did this DU the other day. If you unpack that, it's a, a third of a gigabyte source tree. Um, you build that against some of the outputs that you get from the Zen build system, or at least some of the outputs that you would get from the Zen build system if it bothered to ship them. Um, and then you get, uh, well, a bunch of .a files. It's all asynchronous, very confusing. Um, a bunch of .a files, a bunch of headers, a weird compiler wrapper script, a spec file a specs file for GCC, uh, that kind of thing. Not a proper cross-build environment. We don't want to rebuild GCC because you're the, 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 we're just targeting the native CPU here, where, but we need a completely different uh, symbol namespace, maybe some different compiler options, things like that. So then you use that wrapper script to run Python's configure. Um, but of course, you can't really, I mean, you can't do this in a Python tree that you're also building the normal way because it's a different environment. It's, it's a bit like a cross build. As far as configure is concerned, it is a cross build because the executables that come out of this process are Zen guest images and can't be run as executables. So configure can't run them. Uh, so technically then, yes, it's a cross build. And then, of course, we need to mix that up with the pieces of, of, of PyGrub itself that come, came out of Zen. Um, now, things get even worse with um, one of our other principal targets, which is QMU. Um, QMU is used in Zen systems to emulate a PC. If you have a fully virtualized guest, it needs an emulated PC, and we use QMU for that, like everybody does. Um, <clears throat> if your QMU has a security vulnerability in it, then that's a vulnerability in the whole system, at least if you run any HEM guests. Uh, we don't like this, so uh, for a long time we've had a thing called, we call it stub domains, but basically you run your QMU in a domain of its own. It has privilege to access the memory of the guest. It doesn't have privilege with respect to the whole system. So if the guest has some kind of, you know, it, it has some kind of trickery and it takes over its own QMU, then, well, fine, that QMU can't do anything that the guest couldn't have done itself anyway. Um, so, yeah, good luck with that. Great. Um, unfortunately, the version of QMU that we have managed to do this to is a decade-old fork. 
I'm not sure it's even in Debian still. Um, there is, since then, the upstream QMU community have rushed off and become a hive of activity, um, and they do all sorts of much better, cooler things now, and it's much less crazy. Um, and now I want to cross-build that. In order to cross-build a QMU that can do all the hardware servicing for a Zen domain, that QMU needs to be linked against a pile of libraries that come out of the Zen toolstack libraries, um, special functions for accessing the memory of other domains and manipulating them in various ways, uh, IPC and interdomain communication mechanisms. And those are all in zen.git. But of course, we don't want a standard build of zen.git. Those, li those libraries, if you just build them in the normal way, are built for your local operating system. Whereas what we actually want is want them built against this NetBSD thing. So now we're going to have to build zen.git again using this weird wrapper script. Um, so you run the weird, weird wrapper script, Zen's configure, notices it's cross-compiling, you get a subset of the build deliverables out of your build, and then you have some .a files which go together with these .a files and some include files and then you can run QMU's configure against the two things together and it's almost like you're setting up a little parallel cross world. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop hand waving now about this diagram and start hand waving about what might be done. So that Somehow the most official or, or kind of formal way of doing this would be to say, well, these NetBSD rump kernels are, 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 are they're very like an architecture. You run configure, you run make, they produce deliverables. Um, so we'll call them an architecture. Um, so that means you have a, a, a rump kernel AMD64, a rump kernel i386, a rump kernel ARM, a rump kernel ARM64, <laughs> And so that's four architectures. They'd, they'd be partial architectures because only a tiny subset of the, the archive would be built. Um, here we go again. Um, and all of this infrastructure with, with four additional architectures in the archive would exist only for, really, for the benefit of Zen, which is itself just a, you know, one tiny thing in the Zen ecos in, in the whole Debian ecosystem. So... I don't think that's, that's really a sensible thing to do. Um, so another thing I thought was, so that's obviously not on. If I, if I were to try to do that, people would, would, would hate me. Um, I'd probably hate myself as well, so I'm not going to do that. Um, so on the other end of the scale, it occurred to me that I could upload... I could cause the zen.git package to produce a copy of its source code as a, as a source deb, um, and I could probably even persuade the QMU people and maybe the Python people to do the same thing, and then I could have some package that had all of this and a giant nightmare build script, and that just you know, <laughs> by hand did all of this stuff, and it would be sort of a bit like IA32 libs in that any time you wanted to add a new one of these, you'd have to go and find the original packages, and there might be a whole stack, right? I haven't got as far as compiling Python yet. Um, I've been working on, on QMU, but I imagine that in order to get Python to work, there'll be a bunch of libraries I have to do first. Um, so I have to go to each of those libraries and persuade them to produce one of these source packages, and then add them to my giant build the world thing. Yes. And you really... Am I on? Yes. And you really want it uh, to be in the Debian archive? All of it? Well, what I want yes. what I want to be in the Debian archive is this file. Because this file, right, as far as the user is concerned, this file is a piece of the infrastructure for the Zen system. And it should be used, actually, this should be used by default. You shouldn't be using your host compiled QMU by default. You should be using this because it's more secure. Um, 
So all of this infrastructure is just there to produce this deliverable, which dumps in the, on the user system in user lib zen, never heard of it type place, and the tools automatically pick it up, and the user is completely oblivious of all of this. Um, so that's one reason I want it in the archive. Um, but once you start doing this kind of thing, the next thing that will happen is the user will say, oh, wow, cool. Does that mean I can write, you know, I can write Python scripts and have them run in, in, in Zen directly? So now they want this Python rump image, and they want to be able to meld it with their own you know, Python scripts, which means that the tools that probably live in here that manage the file system image that this domain runs on also want to be delivered to the user. Of course, those are all BSD FFS. So we're going to, you know, the, the part of this is, is, is I'm sort of taking a whole operating system and saying this whole operating system is, is just we're going to package it up neatly, neatly in a little, in a little package with not too many tentacles and, and, and bury it in Debian. You were yeah, first. So I've got pretty much the same kind of problem with uh, Windows cross compilers. So the, the, idea, the aim of the Windows cross tool chain is to end up with, same as you with your QDM image that ends up in the Debian archive. We use the uh, Windows cross compilers to build Windows executables that end up in Debian installer and a bunch of DLLs that end up in Wine Gecko that's used for Wine. And like you say, once you start doing that, there are other people who say, oh, it'd be really nice to have uh, all these libraries that we could use for the, with the cross compiler for Windows. And then you end up with the same kind of problem, asking people to produce source devs or, but then you get, which, uh, you get pushback from the other Debian maintainers, which is perfectly sensible. And they say, this only makes sense if we add it as a proper Debian architecture. And then everything just sort of falls out automatically with configure and so on, because you just get the triplet and it all works. But if you don't do that, it's a nightmare amount of work with all the source packages that need to be used. And you either do it on the side somewhere, and then you can't get it in the Debian archive, or you do it properly. Uh, it's tempting to suggest that you could, uh, rather than making everybody ship source devs, uh, you could, from the bottom up, uh, for each Linux architecture pair for the NetBSD thing that you're trying to produce, uh, build a binary package which is labeled architecture AMD64, but is in fact, in fact contains NetBSD AMD64 stuff off in some path that nobody cares about. Um, and you could deal with fixing up the paths in your build system. Um, that would at least let you get the binary objects into the archive. Uh, and your top level build could be could just produce QMUDM, but at least then you'd be able to have uh, build dependencies for sensible ish things. Right, so what you're suggesting is that Python should be the Python, the real main Python package should be changed to produce these rums in AMD64 libraries and things off in a separate path. Uh, something like that in separate binary packages. Right. I've absolutely um, no idea what That makes Matthias would think Python about build depend on this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, alternatively, uh, you could... So, you'd, you don't necessarily have to have everything work the same way. You could have a Python Zen, separate source package which you occasionally resync. Uh, but have other packages which are less, you know, complex and intertwined than, Py than Python uh, do the do those binary packages directly. Right. So, but that means convincing all the maintainers to take all that on. Another approach would be. So you do the dash source packages. Yeah. Right. But yeah, if you with the other libraries, the, the other libra library side that you want to build grumps and binaries, that would mean convincing their maintainers to take that on. The other approach, which you've mentioned on the mailing list already, would be source build dependencies. So, 
Uh, I commented on source build dependencies at the last DevConf, and I'm not sure I managed to convince Walter that uh, that uh, this was legitimate. But I don't, given that every package already requires to be able to fetch its own source as part of its build process, uh, I don't see why you can't legitimately do apt-get source in a packages, build, stick it somewhere in your build tree, and then do that. You don't need to invent infrastructure for source build dependencies to make this work. In the worst case, you need to fix a couple of firewalls and build these or something. But there's there's no reason why you can't just... Uh, what, you're suggesting work. having Debian rules call out get source? Yes. Uh, Every, it, people, people, people have a sort of. Uh, some people appear to have a visceral reaction to this, but I don't see why it is illegitimate. Uh, it is allowed by the building policy called apt-get. It's not allowed to make arbitrary network calls. Right, and apt-get source is not is obviously quite different from calling apt-get install. It just fiddles with your current directory state. Uh, boggle. Um, that. That would certainly make all of this a lot easier. You could make a little Python Zen package that you could generate these little stub packages that would go, ah, oh, well, I'll just get the Python source and I'll mess with its build system slightly, <laughs> put my weird compiler on the path, and then I'll just build it. It'll all be fine. <laughs> you, would, you, would want to, you would want to make sure that you're getting the versions you expect or something, but you might, you might need sanity checks on all sorts of things. But uh, it doesn't seem fundamentally very difficult. Right. Um, I, I, I'm going to put in a, like a built using then, am I? Yes. <laughs> uh, that's, that matches the built using semantics precisely. This is a novel and radical suggestion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised to find you proposing it because the idea that the package build should go off and fetch stuff from somewhere. So the Traditionally, we've done that in, in, in places like sbuild and not in the rules file. Indeed. Uh, and, and it's not declarative either. It is indeed not. I'm certainly more comfortable with other things like, uh, so I think things like partial architectures are a much more elegant approach to this. They're also uh, ton more infrastructure to, to stand up. So, right. so um, I'm suggesting this not as a particularly elegant thing, but as something that, as far as I can see, should work today without having to build up a load of stuff. I guess if I do do that, then having deployed it, it will be very easy to persuade people that there should be some better <laughs> infrastructure for, <laughs> for source package dependencies. This was true of IA32 libs too, and look how long that took, but yes. <laughs> yeah, it might be hard to get it through you now. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have anybody from the FTP team here? <laughs> Are they are they listening to the stream? There's a couple of FTP assistants here. You can corner over one as well. Right. Well, maybe we should do that. Um, so uh, yes. Um, so we've we've talked about partial architectures a lot uh, over, over the years, but nobody's ever really got very far with them, at least not in the Debian archive. Uh, is, the, is the main blocker simply working out how we do a build D that doesn't actually try to build everything, as is usual? Uh, uh, how, how do you mean? Deepakit has a Windows architecture element, doesn't it, somewhere? Um, I've seen it in triplet table, I'm sure. Well, the whole thing would be a cross-build. Well, right? yeah. The, the main blocker for me, anyway, is getting the patch that provides the uh, Windows triplet as a, an architecture into Deepakit. So it means convincing GM. That's for now. So 
So I was going to say that in terms of actually getting partial architectures off the ground, one of the things that I think has, has always um, been a de facto blocker is we talk in general terms about how we can, how we could do this, but I think somebody needs to come up with a concrete proposal and, and show that, yes, if we did this, this is the set of packages that would make sense to build and why, and, and we have a buildable closed set that it's useful to do this for that's less than, than the architecture and has some sort of a, um, a policy around it which isn't altogether arbitrary. Um, and I think if we had something defined like that, we then you're right, we would need to have the implementation of the, the builder as well, but that uh, yeah, it's not going to move until somebody puts together a, a more fleshed out proposal. The closedness of the set is, of course, much easier when cross-building, so perhaps this winds up effectively blocked on build profiles so that we have that more official. But, uh, you know, most, most, of the, most of the binaries we need presumably, in fact, come from some other architecture because you're using them as multi-arch foreign things and, and cross-building. Right. Um, I mean, if you, did this, if you did this as a partial architecture, I imagine it would be like a little multi-arch stub thing, but you, you, you'd have to make sure that nobody thought it was a good idea to install the, you know, the, the, the Python Rumpzen AMD64.deb is not really usable as a, uh, for satisfying multi-arch cross the Dependencies. Well, this is Python NetBSD ARM64, isn't it? Or NetBSD something. Is that right? Well, it's the, the thing, you know, the actual Python file that, that's got the Python code in it um, isn't, okay, it's an ELF, but it's a compressed ELF kernel. Um, and to execute it, you feed it to the Zen tool stack as a as a, as, a, as a kernel image, and you can't, you know, you can't run it, use it to run Python scripts on the host. Right. So that that is not a that is then not a Python two point seven dot deb. That is Python two point seven dash stub dom or something dot deb. Uh, you know, the the it has different semantics. It deserves a different package right. name regardless of what you do. The uh, presumably, this would be not too terrible for the Python maintainers since they wouldn't actually build this normally. It would be a thing in their control file with an architecture field that caused it not to actually be built for anything useful. Right. Um, I worry, though, about wrinkles. So we've got here the other examples that we might want to do some cross builds for, well, Windows, maybe Wine, or whatever. Um, it's likely that this also would require some some violence done to the upstream source code. I, I'm not expecting to be able to compile Python unmodified. It, it's possible. In principle, it should just work, but but there's going to be some bugs, and some of them are going to be bugs in Python that. You know, I will try to fix upstream, but there, there's, there's always a lag with that. And some of them will be bugs in this whole rump setup. Well, when I say bugs, infelicities, ways in which that it's not like a real system, and there'll have to be some bodge. This is where I think Debian ports can come in handy, because in Debian ports, you're allowed to carry packages from the main archive with your extra patches until they get merged upstream or merged into the main Debian package. That, that's an excellent idea. All I need to do then is to depend on something, is, is to have my, uh, my, you know, your main Zen, Zen hypervisor get me all my stuff dot dev meta package just needs to depend on the relevant package from ports and nothing can possibly go wrong. <laughs> then you try to get this into testing. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Are all of these uh, binaries that you're trying to build uh, only useful in on a already AMD64 Arch install, or do they could, could are, are you aiming to have these packages, these new ones that you're building, be usable without the rest of uh, the Linux host architecture? 
Um, well, okay, so in principle, uh, supposing herd were ported to Zen and could be a Zen DOM nod. In principle, the same Python rump Zen AMD64 libraries, executables, etc., would do for the herd as would do for Linux. And actually, the build system for this stuff doesn't involve the host libc. And so it doesn't involve the host kernel headers. It involves NetBSD kernel headers, which are supplied here at the bottom left. Um, and it gets more confusing than that because um, if for some reason you're running an i386 DOM0 rather than AMD64 DOM0, there are a couple of reasons why you might be doing that, you probably still want to be running an AMD64 Rump Zen PV stub images. So probably we only want Rump Zen AMD64 and not Rump Zen i386, and the i386 users will be using AMD64 packages, um, and that works. That can work at the moment because, as I understand it, the GCC that's in Debian i386 can generate AMD64 code. It just doesn't come necessarily with a libc, but I, you know I've got a libc. That's fine. Um, so so far, app get source in the rules file has, has is 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 the most promising suggestion here. Or go around all the packages, persuading them to produce a source package deb. One other option that you could consider that would probably be a lot of work uh, would be to have your uh, rump zen dash every one of the packages that you actually want to be available here under each one of the architectures, which is kind of like what Fedora does for their MinGW toolchain. Sorry, I'm not sure I follow. Um, so on Fedora, the MinGW toolchain is uh, MinGW32-GCC, and then there's a huge slew of libraries that are the Windows binaries uh, that you could use to link against uh, if you want, say, SQLite uh, for right. uh, Windows, then th there are a collection of MinGW32-SQLite uh, packages. It sounds like this is kind of analogous to what you're trying to do here. You have a bunch of Rump Zen binaries that you want to put together uh, and possibly libraries that they share, except they are only shared at build time. Yeah, so yes. it's, it's kind of a mess. Source packages, which are the same thing with the prefix. Ninja. Right, right. I mean, I could. Uh, that that's another thing that I could try to get through the FTP team. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. are archbold as well, because yeah. because it has a foreign arch inside it, right? <laughs> it's archbold in the sense that we're supposed to build not arch any. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's jolly good. <laughs> it moves the problems elsewhere. <laughs> like we could use XDEP, I presume? Please don't use XDEP. Speaking of the selfie. I'm not even sure it works anymore. Yeah, I, I mean. I've used it two years ago. So it seems we're, 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 we're not very keen on the IA32 libs-ish kind of yeah. we'll have one thing that knows how to do it all and does it all in the right order. Um, the remaining options are probably that they all involve Debs that contain these rumps and AMD64 libraries, and at the end, PV kernel images. And the question is, the, the question we're left with is, how do those debs get built, particularly from which source code, 
Um, and our options that have been considered so far are we should have um, source devs, we should go apt get source in Debian rules, or we should duplicate the source code. Does anybody have a fourth option that's less bad? No. Has anybody been writing this down, by the way? No, I see I'm going to have to write it up later. OK. Well, I guess that's some kind of conclusion. Um, <laughs> that, at least is, that at least allows me to go to the FTP team and present them with something that looks like a choice. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, using Debian ports was mentioned. Uh, yes, Debian ports is no good because um, this, these deliverables need to be in main. Okay. This, this deliverable here needs to be in, in well, probably main AMD64 multi-arch. So, you know, unless we're allowed to depend from main into ports, which obviously, <laughs> right, but that's obviously not... Yeah, I can't see how you could ever get that to work properly. <laughs> well, you just showed that an app sources the D snippet with your Debian for its key. I guess it will have to go to non free or something. I would point out there is one, very, at least one very important precedent for packages using, well, not apt-get source, but apt-get in other ways in their build system, and that is Debian installer. Uh, it uh, fetches, a, it, rather than using build dependencies, to fetch bits of the installer, which would then have to go in debs in some strange way or something. It uh, uses a specialized apt configuration in its own build system in order to fetch uh, the installer components that need to go in the init RDs that it is about to shove into the archive via by hand. Right, so effectively it, it uses apt to download debs, uh, not source U-debs, U-debs. U-debs, but from the archive. Yes. So it seems, at least oh, in obviously, principle, fairly obviously, similar. Obviously, source packages are supposed to be allowed too. Then, great, yeah. uh, brilliant. So I, <laughs> I haven't done it in the Debian archive. I've did it in the Ubuntu archive, but I was uh, fetching source packages, and then I would cross compile them. And then I would use the results again to bootstrap the Android toolchain. But I was uh, explicitly doing apt-get source and then declaring my build using such that I don't have to duplicate GCC and libc and blah, blah, blah. This way, I essentially was build depending on a source package. OK, uh, which, um, which source packages contain the apt-get runes so that I can? Uh, I, I can send you an email. I'd, okay. Yeah, I'll send you an email. Great. Well, maybe that's actually the answer to my problem. Yeah. Oh. Hooray. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs> 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 thank you.